Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very, very special episode of Esoteric Atlanta. This is an episode brought to you by you. I'm going to be answering some of your questions today. If you are new to this channel and this is the first video you're watching, you're probably thinking, who the hell is this lady and why do I want to hear her answers to some questions? That's okay. I would suggest that you start with some of our other videos first so that you get to know me better. Now it is really early in the morning on Friday, May 28th. This video will not air until Sunday. However, I think my sister might be in labor. Therefore, I might be a new aunt by the end of the day. We'll see. I love being an aunt. I have a nephew and a niece, and now I'm about to have another niece. So I'm super, super, super excited, but I wanted to get this video done before my new niece takes me away. All right, let's get started. So this was inspired because one of our subscribers here, Tanya, asked about my t-shirts in a previous video, and I realized we hadn't done a and a in a really long time. So, um, and I had somebody else, Taylor, ask in the question section also about my, my t-shirts that I wear that are cut. I wore this specifically because it is a cut t-shirt. And so the story behind my cut t-shirt my like job in real life is I am a Mysore teacher. I teach Ashtanga yoga in a Mysore setting, which is the traditional setting to teach yoga. Now, I personally don't like wearing tight clothes. I hate wearing blue jeans. I like wearing yoga pants, but like tight tops, jeans, I just never felt comfortable. And so those really cute uh, workout tops that you can get in the store that are tight, I would wear those, but I would always get really uncomfortable. And when I would wear them for practice, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because I would only have them on for like two hours max. But when you're teaching Mysore, you're in this hot, sweaty room for like three, four hours. And so I was getting really, really annoyed with these tight tops. Now I had cut some t-shirts previously in my 20s and I went home one day and decided that I was just going to cut a t-shirt and wear that to teach in. Well it was so comfortable that I started cutting all of my t-shirts and in fact my boyfriend now cuts his t-shirts as well. So there's no skill involved with cutting your t-shirt. If I can do it, anybody can do it. I don't know how to sew. I know that there are people online, you can look on Pinterest, where people can like sew in cool ribbons in their t-shirts or whatnot. I'm not that fancy. I don't know how to do that. And a lot of the t-shirts I wear when I record are not necessarily t-shirts I wear to practice in now. I kind of have two different wardrobes. T-shirts that I wear that are like more for street wear versus t-shirts that I wear when I'm teaching or practicing. So this is one of the t-shirts. So basically all I do is I cut around the um, armhole. Now when you first start, make sure you use a t-shirt that you don't mind messing up because when you first start, you might be a little bit nervous. And when you first start, I would suggest definitely start with just cutting around the seam of the armhole, the seam of the neck, and then when you feel more confident in your ability to cut, then you can start to make the shapes a little bit different. For example, this one, I cut the armhole a little bit bigger. I also created a V-neck, which I've done with some of my other t-shirts as well. Now, I'm not super anal retentive. I don't like measure to make sure each armpit hole is matching and all that good stuff because I actually kind of like the imperfections of that style. Like I have a White Castle t-shirt that I cut and one of the sleeves is thinner than the other one, but I actually really like the way that turned out. And so I would suggest, again, just starting with some old t-shirts that you don't mind messing up and then move on from there to t-shirts that you want to look a certain way. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually like go to a place like Target and I'll go to the men's department and I will get like, this is a men's small from Target. And therefore it gives me some, some space, it's blousy, and I can cut, 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 and create my own t-shirt. Sometimes the women's shirts are still a little tight and they don't look as good when they're cut, but that's just for my body. You have to do what works for your body and what you are comfortable with. If you start cutting your t-shirts, and if you want me to, email me pictures of your t-shirts, and I'll do a video of all the t-shirts from around the world people have cut, because it truly is super comfortable especially if you live in an area like I live where it's really, really, really hot in the summertime. I mean, they call us hot Lana. This is the Sun Belt, and it's humid. And so it's nice to be able to wear something 
that's loose and cotton and breathable. All right, so I'm just gonna go down the list. So Carrie says, Haya, there was a moment you were speaking to Tom when you had mentioned about Shakespeare and Helen Keller not being who we've been taught. Can you provide more info as my search stalled, but I seek the truth? All right, well, I don't know much about um, Helen Keller, so that might have been from somebody else, but I do believe I've heard that as well, that maybe Helen Keller, who we've been taught she was, but I don't have much information on that. I have driven through her hometown though, which was interesting. Um, as far as Shakespeare, I did a, a brief Monday mystery video on Shakespeare, which I'll place in this, the description box below. And the Monday mysteries I do are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be more like fun topics. And so that's why I picked the Shakespeare. The first time the identity of William Shakespeare was brought up in my life was when I was a junior in high school and it was my honors English class. So that was 21 years ago and it just makes sense to me. I do believe that it was Francis, Sir Francis Bacon. There's a lot about Sir Francis Bacon that's very mysterious, um, especially when it comes to like the dark cult, the cabal. And as we know, a lot of what we've been taught in our world has been very much manipulated by these elites. Now, someone did suggest that I do like a round table about the identity of Shakespeare because there's all these other different theories as well. And I would really love to do that. I don't feel like I am scholarly enough to be able to contribute much more to the conversation except for the fact that I believe it was Sir Francis Bacon and I have my reasons, but my reasons are more based in like conspiracy and have a lot to do with like the Georgia Guidestones, all that kind of stuff. So I would love it if you guys know any scholars out there, perhaps that have their own YouTube channels, that would love to have a discussion about who Shakespeare really was with different viewpoints and different opinions, let me know. And I would love to bring those people on my channel and let them all talk about their viewpoints on who they believe the person really was, even if they believe it really was some guy from Stratford upon Avon. Now, I will suggest when you are researching like the identity of Shakespeare, don't use Google. Google is censored. Um, I use DuckDuckGo. And you can even find like lectures and videos on DuckDuckGo that are heavily censored on platforms like Google. But I will say one of the most interesting things about the theory of Shakespeare, which really could be a good starting point in your own research, is the fact that throughout his plays, there are messages sent, obviously, to people in the know. For example, in my video on Shakespeare, I brought up um, Hollow Earth. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, there is a mention of the Hollow Earth. And that's really fascinating. And so I would start with that if you want to do an even deeper dive than what I did for, for our show, for our Mystery Monday show. Just look up under DuckDuckGo, coding within the Shakespearean plays, coding within the King James Bible, because the King James Bible was also allegedly written by Shakespeare. And we know King James, as Juan O'Savan taught us, was a Freemason. That's not shocking to anybody on this channel. So next question, Adon George, I hope I'm saying your name right, says, I would love to hear the story of your awakening, which some may know, but as a newish viewer, I'm wondering what your aha moment was. Well, thank you so much for being a newish viewer. I appreciate all you guys who come to my channel and listen to me talk so and listen to me share my crazy ideas. So I super appreciate you being here, this channel really would not exist if it weren't for you guys. So I thank you so much for that. So my, I didn't, I had, I have some moments that were like aha moments, but I had a lot of experiences when I was younger that um, were very odd. I had a lot of paranormal experiences. I am RH negative, uh, which we've talked about extensively on this channel, which is kind of the bloodline of the elite. And again, I, my great, great, great grandfather was born into the English royal family. I've had a lot of really weird health issues associated with that. Um, and so there was always something kind of going on internally within me, even as a child, which maybe didn't um, allow me to fall hook, line and sinker for a lot of the propaganda that we were taught as kids. I got extremely sick when I was 15. It was super, super weird just to kind of be brief about it. Um, I woke up with like all the lymph nodes in my body swollen one morning under my armpits, everything like that. I couldn't put my arms down. They were so big. I had scratch marks all over my body. My temp body temperature is typically at 96, which is 
normal for an RH negative for the body temperature to be low. Uh, and normally it's 98.6 Fahrenheit is average. Again, my 96 typical every day. But when I was 15, my body temperature actually dropped down to 92. And some other really weird stuff happened. Like I would be laying in the bed and I wouldn't be able to like, I'd be like spread eagle on the bed and I couldn't move my arms or my legs. It felt like I was being pinned down. My parents would have to come like knock my arms and my legs just to get them to move again. Very, very, very strange. And um, I just eventually got better. I was tested for everything, leukemia, diabetes, you name it. I was tested for it, had spinal taps, all sorts of stuff. And obviously everything came back negative. Um, I believe now that, that was a very spiritual thing that happened to me. I believe it was like a rite of passage from this bloodline. And so even though at that point I didn't know that's what that was, I think I kind of intuitively understood that that was something pretty major. And it did, it definitely changed the direction of my life. But then I had another really big aha moment in 2016. Now the 2016 elections, presidential elections, the big ones that kind of started this whole thing off with number 17 and the military movement with the Alliance. I was unaware of that in 2016. And actually that was the one presidential election I didn't vote in. I had gone through a lot. I was in India at the time and I usually vote in every single election. And I just did not vote in this one. I just could not focus. I, you know, Hillary Clinton, who wants to vote for Hillary Clinton? I mean, come on. The, every, even, even diehard Democrats know that she's corrupt and she's awful. So, and of course at that point, Mr. T was just like this really rich, like billionaire that owned real estate and he was a reality show guy. And I just was like, whatever. Anyway, so when he won, my boyfriend and I were in India and it was just kind of like, oh, okay. And I remember actually being kind of excited that at least Hillary didn't win. You know, like, well, let's just see what this guy can do because he's not a politician. Around the same time, I was um, taking an oil bath, which we do that in Ashtanga Yoga. An oil bath is basically you lather yourself up with like castor oil and you sit from anywhere from 10 minutes to like an hour and let the castor oil like pull out inflammation from your body. And so I was taking an oil bath, I had oil all over me and I'd set my computer up and I was watching uh, something my boyfriend had been wanting me to watch, which was this Jordan Maxwell documentary or lecture on the Saturnalian Brotherhood, the cult of Saturn. And if I can find that video with censorship, it might not be available, but if I can find it, I'll link that video down in the description box below. And I was stuck sitting on this floor with oil all over me, all over my hands. So I couldn't stop, stop the video. So I had to sit there like the whole hour and listen to this lecture and it unnerved me. It wasn't even like a red pill. It was a black pill. Like it put me through such a depression that it took me about a year to really accept everything that was said. And again, the reason why it put me in that depression is because I knew it was true. I knew everything he was saying was true. I am also a distant relative of uh, Strom Thurmond, who was like the longest running senator in the United States of America. He was my grandmother's cousin on my mom's side. And so I have a lot of kind of ties, loose ties to this cabal, um, which I think I kind of intuitively knew, even though my family is not active or not a part of this cabal at all. I grew up in a Presbyterian home. We went to church twice a week, all that good stuff. And around the time that number 17 started posting, my boyfriend had been following this woman called Meganon. And I can't say too, too much because of censorship, but she was posting first about stuff going down behind the scenes between this alliance and this like, you know, dark cult cabal that had been running our world. I already knew that Washington DC was like satanic. I already knew that. I think most people kind of already know that. Um, but I didn't realize how in depth their depravity reached until number 17. When number 16 plus one, I have to be really careful about what I say, started posting, we started doing some, some loose research. We would just kind of loosely follow it and everything started to make sense. And I don't remember like actually a moment where I accepted, where it like really hit me what they, you know, do as far as like their drug party, as Janine calls it, the, you know, and the wine, you know what I'm saying? I don't actually remember like learning about that and then having this moment, this shocked moment. I think 
it was just a slow learning and all of a sudden being like, yeah, this, this is real. And it's all over the Bible. This stuff is all in the Bible. And I'm just really excited that we get to be alive and to witness this. I know that it's going to be a crazy summer. I've heard some stuff might be going down that might shock us all, but it's necessary in order for all of this to straighten itself out. And, you know, there's no excuse for what these people have done. And so I'm excited, as I'm sure all of you are, to actually be here on this planet at this time and witness everything that's happening and witness a timeline shift where now we get to go into the age of Aquarius and we get to live by different rules. Okay, so next question, Secretly Sweet Lottie. Um, he wrote, yes, a question popped up today about our known origins of dinosaurs. Are they another psyop? What are the earliest actual recordings of dinosaur bones? Are the ones in our museums completely made up to back up Darwin's theories? Thus is Darwin's story also Kabbalah's fantasy concocted from Masonic rites? Possibly. Um, I, you know, I'm pretty, you know, as far as like my own personal opinion on things, I'm a really open-minded person. I really am. Um, I have my, my strong beliefs. Like I know for sure that right now we're in a battle between good and evil. And I know for sure things have been manipulated, but I was, th I've been thinking a lot about like our timeline and here's kind of my opinion on like dinosaurs and our timeline and all that kind of stuff. Um, and take it with a grain of salt. I'm not even attached to my own opinion. I'm willing to be proved wrong on this. This is just kind of what I think might be somewhat close to the actual truth compared to what they're telling us. So a lot of Christians will say that our earth is only about 6,000 years old. And I actually do not believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. I think the timeline that we're on right now is a 6,000 year timeline. I do believe that Atlantis was here before we were here. Now, as far as the, the people that lived on Atlantis, I don't know if they looked like you or me. They might have been like alien life. I have no idea. But I do believe that something happened to destroy Atlantis and then a new timeline started, which would be like the creation story that we see in the Bible and in the Quran and, the, and in the Torah. Now, as far as dinosaurs, yes, Darwin, in my opinion, from my research, was a complete Freemason Luciferian. Now, people will like to tell you that Darwin was an atheist, but you cannot be a Freemason if you are an atheist. So that's BS. I know, I, I know that I do not trust the Smithsonian at all. And that's because of my deep dive into the giants. That the Smithsonian, according to my research, has been actively sued because of trying to get rid of evidence of giants that then would disprove evolution and they want to stick to this narrative. Now, this narrative of evolution, in my opinion, is, is one that makes us feel not special, that we're just some accident, some cataclysm of nature, and there's nothing about us that means anything, which is nothing could be further from the truth. We are very uniquely made, we are very powerful, but this cabal does not want us to know that. Now, if you look through the Old Testament of the Bible, there is mentions of a beast that can't be slain. Is this the dinosaur? I don't know. Were there dinosaurs still around when this new timeline started? I don't know. I guess we'll see. I do believe that they at one point existed. It's just where they actually existed and what time period they existed in is what I question. And are all the fossils we see real fossils? I have no idea. If we find out at the at the end of this that they're all plastic, I would not be shocked. Um, I do also believe that the dinosaur could could be a reference to dragons. But I also believe that, that the dragon reference could also be referencing some Luciferian stuff as well. So that's something that we'll just have to wait and see. Nothing shocks me anymore. So again, if it turns out that they never even existed at all, then I won't be shocked either. So Darlene asked, or she said, I received a download or thought about chakras. I would like, if you would, an explanation about that. I have read on this in the past, but fresh insight would be great. Thank you. Love your videos. Thank you so much, Darlene. Thank you for being here. I am actually going to build a big show around chakras and meridian points um, 
So on David's channel, we're reading right now the book of Jubilee, which we're doing a recap here on our channel on Wednesdays. And then we're starting to get into um, Isaac and Isaac's son, Jacob. And I think most of you might be familiar with the story of Jacob's ladder from the Bible that will also be covered in the book of Jubilees, which in my opinion is the chakra system, is the energy point system within our bodies, coming all the way up to our pineal gland. I have a really good friend who is a Reiki master. She's been on this channel before. Um, and I want to talk with her too about that because she's also a chemistry teacher. So she really understands the way energy works. So if you'll hold on, Darlene, we're going to, or I'm going to put together a bigger video covering that. With that being said though, as far as like my yoga, which the yoga that I practice comes directly from India, 99.9% .9 of the yoga you see in the United States or in Europe or in Canada and Australia is bastardized yoga. It's not really real yoga. Um, it's just a morphed version of what they actually teach through these ancient scriptures. Now they do talk about these energy points in yoga. However, my lineage of yoga, we don't focus so much on them because focusing too much on like one energy point often kind of creates a bit of derangement, which we'll get into. For example, like your sacral point here, if you're if you feel really low in your own like power source, which is your solar plexus, if you focus so much on that, it, it can cause some weakness within the other energy points. And so it's better just to kind of work with everything as a whole and understand that as human beings, we're never going to be totally balanced. We're always going to have like difficulties in certain areas. That's just part of being human. But beyond the seven chakras that come from your um, perineum, all the way up to your head. You also have energy points in your hands and in your feet. You have meridians, you have nadis, like nadis are like rivers of energy that run through the body. You have three main nadis. There's like 75,000, but we really talk about three. The main one being Shashuna, which runs up the spine. That's why in a lot of um, Eastern practices like yoga or Tai Chi, they focus a lot on the spine. It's because that's the energy cycle where things run up and down if that makes sense. You also have your bundas, which are locks in the body that are used through the breath. The breath is an integral, obviously, part of our living, breathing being, hence why they don't want us to breathe right now. But that's a story for another day. Um, so, so I'm going to work on a much more elaborate video for you guys to go into more detail about all of that stuff, because that is super important. And I do think that understanding that or having exposure to that will help us move to our next stage of, of enlightenment, moving into the age of Aquarius. So infinite traveler Adam asked, what do you think about organic portals, i.e. individuals who are supposedly soulless software programs for lack of a better term? By the way, on this occasion, I'd like to thank you for keeping the description of my novel up on your YouTube channel and interviewing me, several potential agents. Awesome, cool. So Adam also wrote a book. I had an interview with Adam. I'll, I'll put the link to that. Uh, interview in the description box below for you guys and a snippet of his novel is always in the, in the description box so you guys can go and read that. Yes, Adam, good. I'm so glad people are are taking notice of your work right now. So organic portals. I do believe that there are organic portals and many uh, faiths, spiritual faiths outside of even Christianity, there is a belief that you have to actually earn your soul. And so people can be like walking empty vessels where they can attract uh, darker energies to kind of do their bidding. This is really big in the law of one, which is the raw material, which we have spoken about. Again, I'll, I'll link those videos down as well for you guys. And I know from my own experience with like petty tyrants, like narcissist, um, people are kind of used as these organic portals that maybe don't, these people haven't like earned their soul yet. You know, you're talking a, a philosophy where we live many lifetimes right? And so it's going to take a new soul or a new, new person to really gain that wisdom to then have a soul is the theory behind that. And so these organic portals, these people that have not earned their soul yet, or maybe their soul isn't that big yet, are able to be manipulated and used by darker forces to do their bidding. Now within the law of one with Ra, there is the polarized positive and the polarized negative, the service to self, service to others, all that kind of stuff. And so if you're someone who's polarized positive and you're a, a strong soul, like a master soul, then you're going to experience a lot of petty tyrants in your life where you're going to have a lot of organic portals attacking you, narcissists, psychopaths, 
all that kind of, you're going to attract them a lot because in that philosophy, if you are already polarized positive and they can turn you and polarize you negative, then it gives the negative side more energy, if that makes sense. So yes, I do actually believe that there are organic portals. I do actually believe that there are people out there that don't have souls yet, that still have a lot more work to do in this third dimensional reality in order to earn that soul. I know a lot of my fellow Christians out there are not going to like hearing that, but I don't think that that actually conflicts with any Christian theology. It might conflict with church theology, but it, I don't believe it, it, it contradicts anything that's in the the Bible. I'm not talking about just the canonized Bible, but the, all, the whole Bible, all the 777 books. Because Jesus himself even speaks about reincarnation, and he speaks about reincarnation in the book of Luke, honestly, in the canonized Bible, but then obviously we see him speaking about reincarnation a lot in the uh, books that were not included in the canonized Bible. Okay, speaking of Jesus, Mary asked, I do have a question. What are your thoughts on Jesus? Do you believe he was sent as a messenger of God for love and peace as he saw it or something else? I do not believe in the virgin birth, but I do believe he was sent for a reason. I do not believe in religion at all. I believe we should all have a relationship with God. Source, at least I would like to think. Thank you. Mary, I agree with you. I mean, religion, religion is just a label at the end of the day. And the root word of religion is the worship of many gods. And what I believe from my research is that the original Christian faith, what it was meant to be, was more of a philosophy or a practice anyway. And if you look at the older um, books of the Bible, the ones, the Gnostic good books of the Bible, the ones that they you don't know, want in the Bible, they talk a lot about your individual relationship with God and you're working towards that relationship with God that's just inside of you. No priest, no teachers, no one's involved in that. It's just you and God. So I actually don't believe in the virgin birth either. I believe that Joseph was Jesus's biological father. The reason why I don't believe in the virgin birth is because the virgin birth is Canaanite. And this is, I know this makes a lot of Christians very, very upset, but I'm telling you what you've been told is propaganda. It was propaganda that was started in the fourth century at the Council of Nicaea by Constantine. Please look this up. This is not opinion. This is fact. We see in a lot of the missing gospels, the missing books of the Bible, that it talks about Jesus and it talks about his parents, his biological parents being Mary and Joseph. In fact, in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, it talks about God telling Joseph to go to Mary. We know what that means, to create Jesus. Now for the, the pagan gods of Ra and Horus, they were born of virgin births. December 25th, sound familiar? Constantine the Great was not so great. He was not a Christian. We have to realize that this is a complete and utter sham. He was not a Christian. He was Mithraic. Again, there is a, 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 so much evidence for this. When Constantine the Great decided to wage war on the Roman Empire to take over, he manipulated the peasant class to be his soldiers. The peasant class at this point was converting to this new Christian faith. And because of that, Christianity had been labeled illegal. And so a lot of these people were being thrown into the arena with lions and killed very horrifically. And so in order for Constantine to have a great big army to go up against the Roman Empire, he decided to embrace the Christian faith in order to have people do his warring for him. What Constantine was trying to accomplish was basically a new world order back in that time before Constantine, the Roman Empire, had been divided up into four different territories. But once he took it over, it was now one new world order. After he became the leader of the new world order, he then hosted the Council of Nicaea, where he decided what books would be in the Bible and what would be tossed aside. That's where we have our canonized Bible. And it is proven fact that within this council, they changed a lot of the stories in the Bible. They altered them. The uh, Nazarene way uses the term pen of correction. 
So these guys at the Council of Nicaea decided to basically rewrite the Christian faith as it was to that point. Now you'll see if you study the Council of Nicaea that a lot of the bishops that were called to this council would not go up against Constantine. So if Constantine wanted to change Jesus' birth story, no bishop was going to fight him for it. Constantine is paying his bills. Constantine is the reason why this bishop has a job. And Constantine could very well burn that bishop at the stake if he were to disagree with Constantine. Doesn't seem like a thorough council now, does it? And so after all of this was changed and there was an official dogma now within Christianity, any citizens of the Roman Empire caught with any of the books that they banned were heavily punished. And you know what I mean by heavily punished. Hence why so many of these missing gospels were then buried down in tombs in, in Egypt and Ethiopia, where we have now found them today, and obviously the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now it's important to note that Constantine also changed a lot of the holidays. The original Christians did celebrate things like Passover. Christianity itself is supposed to be Judaism 2.0. It's not supposed to be separate from the Jewish faith. It's, it's in a continuation of the Jewish faith. But now in a Christian home, you don't celebrate any of the Jewish holidays. In fact, all of our holidays we celebrate are based in pagan holidays, especially Christmas, which was a huge holiday for human sacrifice for pagans and Canaanites. I don't really want to say pagans, mostly Canaanites. And so this idea that Constantine was a great man and that he created this Bible for us, and everything he placed in that Bible that he corrected in the Bible is true is complete, basically bullshit. The virgin birth story is a Canaanite satanic birth story. It just is. Somebody commented the other day that, you know, if Jesus was born of both Mary and Joseph, then that takes away the idea that he was both God and man. Well, no, it doesn't. Because God, the source, the big God, has no limits. There are no boundaries on God. And miracles happen through normal human action. That's why they're called miracles. And so I do believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I do believe that he knew he came here for a reason. And I do believe he knew that he was going to lose his life. However, sadly, I think a lot of his message has been lost in the politics of the church. I do think the Catholic Church and all the Protestant churches are the horrors of Babylon mentioned in Revelation. I do think that. I do know a lot of churches are not anything the way Jesus wanted his message to, to be spread. Jesus was about love and forgiveness and, and you know, an understanding that you are valuable and that you are also a child of the creator, that you have that inside of you as well, that you have the spark of divinity inside of you as well. You don't need to go to a priest. You don't need to go to someone in higher authority to find God. Jesus's message was that has been in you all along. And don't don't follow a blindly follow a human being because human beings are corrupt. We know that a lot of these preachers are actually Satanist. We know this now because we've had whistleblowers come out and tell incredible stories about these people, you know, that just are not, are not what Jesus taught. Um, I had a friend in LA that used to say if Jesus came back today and saw the state of the church, he'd be like, so not what I meant, guys. And I, I agree with that. So not what I meant, guys. And I find sometimes people that have the strongest relationship with God and the strongest relationship with Jesus are those that don't actually even go to church at all because they don't have the shackles of the church around their ankles and around their heart. They're free. Someone on this channel mentioned once there's a difference between Christianity and churchianity. And that's totally true. There's a huge difference between Christianity and churchianity. Christianity it, in its pure form is a very spiritual faith. It's a very mystical faith and it's a very private faith. And I don't even think you need to call yourself anything in order to have that relationship with God. And so Mary, I think that you were on the right path. So Linda from Amsterdam said hi from Amsterdam. Hi Linda, I have some roots in Amsterdam myself. 
I have no supporters at all. Everyone around me calls me crazy because I don't buy the crap of the government nor the MSM. Can you please check when we will be freed in the Netherlands? Oh, I'm sorry, Linda. Well, first of all, I want you to know that there you're not the only one in the Netherlands that is feeling the way you're feeling. Unfortunately, most of us who see the truth have been very much silenced all over the world, so you don't see us, but I am telling you, girl, you are not alone, and you are not alone globally either. We're all in this together, right? United we stand, where we go one, we go all, we're all in this together. Um, I know the Netherlands, from what I understand, is pretty dirty, which is, oh, I mean, it's, it is what it is. A lot of governments are super dirty. And I liked how Tamara said in our last episode that it's going to take the domino in America falling first before it can fall all over the world. So just hold tight. Keep watching the news. I think something major is about to happen that's going to start that domino effect. And don't worry, you will be free soon. But I am going to add your question to a list of questions for either Tamara or Janine, whichever I film with first, where I can ask them their thoughts on the Netherlands for you. And so I, the last question I have is from someone redeemed y'all. I love that, that channel name redeemed y'all. <laughs> you must be from the South, just like me. Appreciate you, Bryce. I appreciate you too. Would love to hear your overall understanding of where we are be before bright future ahead. What do you know? How much longer of waiting? Um, and she went on to ask, are you a firm, are you firmly believing a flat earth in a dome? As your episode talks about where, were you surprised to hear what to hear Juan objected to it? Sorry, my camera just went out. So I'm going to answer that first. Um, I don't necessarily believe in a flat earth. I brought David Weiss on the channel just to bring a different perspective. So I've never been firm on there being a flat earth. I don't know what we're standing on, to be honest with you. I absolutely don't believe that our earth looks the way NASA tells us our earth looks. I think that's a load of crap. So I don't know what we're actually on. Um, I, I, uh, we asked Janine that question once in a card reading Tom and I did. And basically the cards said it's neither flat nor round. And like basically we're not ready to totally understand what it is we're standing on. So I guess over time that will be revealed. But no, I am not a firm believer in flat earth at all. So um, so I just, I just entertain the idea. I love David. He's got really great points. But I do think there's probably something in between. I am like 99% sure that we have a hollow earth. And the hollow earth theory can go with both the globe earth and with both the flat earth. That there's something beneath us. Um, just there's too much evidence for there to be a hollow earth, um, especially with Admiral Byrd's journals. There's something to it. I also believe that regardless of whether we're on a flat earth or a round earth or whatever the hell we're standing on, that there is a firmament. I do. The Bible talks about this a lot. I do believe that there is a firmament. So we are kind of trapped inside of something like a snow globe, we're kind of trapped here, which uh, a lot of spiritual people, a lot of spiritual philosophies and theories have talked about us being a prison planet, that this is where karma is really heavy, is on our planet. And so when we come here as souls, we're coming here to do a lot of work, that this is one of the most difficult environments to live in is Earth. Now, um, when you heard uh, Juan's interview, he talked about the Tower of Babel, that they were building like a space force to try to go back home. I believe that because I believe that we are, our physical makeup is probably a hodgepodge of different species, different alien life. And so as time goes on, we're going to be able to see more of the truth about what we're actually standing on. It's funny, after we got off the interview with Janine, where Tom asks that question of the cards, like, are we on a flat earth? And the cards was like, the cards were like, it's neither flat nor round. And we kind of ended this, the episode with that question. Right after we got off the, uh, the call, I called Tom and we were like, what the hell are we standing on? Like, what is this? Are we like on some spaceship? Like, what are we actually on? And so I think as time goes on, the cards will probably write. There's a lot we need to get through to understand before we actually understand what it is we live on. Um, but no nothing coming out of NASA is true. So just NASA's just totally propaganda. Like, don't even pay attention to NASA. So all right. Two, how much of the Bible do you realize has been erroneous and place truth over them, please? So I think you're talking about like how much of the Bible do I think is like corrupted and not necessarily useful. 
I think that's what you're asking. Um, as I just said in the question before, I, I believe a lot of the canonized Bible has been changed. It's, I mean, again, I don't believe that this is a fact. This is in multiple, you can do a bunch of research on that. I find that I get, I feel more truth coming from the, the banned books of the Bible. And the reason why I feel like I get more clarity and truth from those books is because again, when Constantine made it, that there's a canonized book and all these other books were then obsolete. A lot of monks, a lot of people that were really big Christians at that time went and hid these books so that they would be revealed later to us. And so these books had been hidden. I mean, most of them weren't even found until the 20th century. So they were hidden for over a thousand years and they hadn't been touched. And so when we see the translations of these missing books, we're seeing like the first edition translation. And the people translating these books are scholars. They're not religious leaders trying to control a narrative to then take control of vulnerable people, which we see a lot in all sorts of religions. So um, I definitely don't adhere to a lot of the lifestyle laws of the Old Testament. I think that's pretty, pretty sad when churches try to stick to those Old Testament laws from like the Torah because Jesus came and basically fixed that where we don't have to live like they lived because that there's some pretty crazy laws back in those days and a lot of these fundamentalist churches will, will live their life that way but that's not important anymore because Jesus came and so so I think that's not really that important I mean we need to study the Old Testament to study it but we don't need to live our lives in the way the Old Testament was lived. Because honestly, if we did, none of us would be here. We all would have been stoned to death at some point for breaking some law in the Torah. I also think that there are a lot of sadistic people that run churches and, and other organizations and other religions that like to use these more violent stories in order to control people. I hate when churches use God as a weapon. I also hate when people teach the love of God by by fear. Like if you don't believe what I'm gonna believe, then you're gonna go to hell. I hate that, that is not the love of God. That's pretty satanic to do that, so I hate that. But um, yes, for my own faith, I really rely more on the missing books of the Bible. And if something doesn't feel right in my gut, then I don't go with it. I just listen to my gut and I listen to my own prayers. And I know that God is a loving God. And so I'm gonna follow that path, the path of loving other people, the path of service to others, the path of generally being a nice person. Okay, so your third question is, what's your interpretation of the Bible, the book of Revelations, and other passages as there seem to be two camps? Believers looking forward to the rapture and believers looking forward to a thousand years of peace on the new earth. So I believe we're about to head into the thousand years of peace on the new earth. And I think that Revelation has been translated completely wrong in the past, um, intentionally. Uh, the Bible itself and a lot of the old missing books of the Bible were written by astrology and astronomy. And so, and you can see this and it's funny because now the church will tell you that stuff's of the devil. But astrology, astronomy, tarot cards, that was all a propaganda in World War II where Hitler worked with the Pope to get the Pope to start teaching that that stuff was evil so that the Nazi party would be the only one with access to that. So if you believe that astrology is of the devil, I'm sorry, but that's Nazi propaganda. So if you look at the book of Revelation, basically everything that's happening is all astrological. There's a great video with a woman named Mickey with Nicholas Vinyama that I'm going to place in the description box below where she goes through the whole planetary system with the book of Revelation with President T, number 45, and stuff that he did back on Twitter back in like 2012 that signifies certain planetary movements within the book of Revelation. I don't believe that the rapture means that people are just going to float up into the heavens. That to me is bunk. I believe the rapture means that our consciousness moves up within us, that we start to understand. After all, apocalypse means to lift the veil. And revelation means to reveal. Things are being revealed to us. I think pastors in the past have wanted to scare the crap out of people that the end times, the end times, were going to be terrifying and violent and we were going to have to live through it. But I don't think that's actually the case. The people who are going through the tribulation are the Canaanites. Because since the beginning, since the book of Genesis, this has been a battle between the Canaanites 
and the Israelites, between the dark and the light, between the children of God and the servants of Lucifer. And we saw in the book of the Holy Twelve, Jesus made it very clear multiple times in the book of the Holy Twelve that the Israelites are not people of Israel. Israelites are anybody that follows God. So even if you, like I am totally a Gentile, I'm European descent, but I would be considered an Israelite in this battle because I follow God, if that makes sense. And so I think that this is a very exciting time. The God that I believe in is not a vengeful God. The God that I believe in is a very loving God. So why would a loving God put his children that he's created, that he gave his own son, that he sacrificed his own son for, why would he put us through hell on earth? Why? He wouldn't. He wouldn't. This is between him and Lucifer. And those that have decided to follow Lucifer and made the choices to do the things necessary, you know what I mean, to follow Lucifer, well, they're going to have to then go through the court system, go through Gitmo, go through military tribunals, and pay the price for that. But for the rest of us, as number 17 says, get your popcorn. It's just the movie's just about to get good and the future is about to be super bright and super exciting. And you asked, okay, so this is an important question. You asked, since you have invested so much time in yoga, do you still believe Jesus is the one true God? There are good videos talking about perhaps yoga may open up doors to demonic spirits. Anybody that's saying yoga opens up doors to demonic spirits, it doesn't know what they're talking about. Period, point blank, end of story. If you ever read the Yoga Sutras, there's no talking about spirits in the Yoga Sutras. That's ridiculous. Again, this is propaganda. And unfortunately, really good people are falling for this ridiculous propaganda. The Yoga Sutras, the first sutra is now the practice of yoga begins. The second sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha, means yoga is the silencing of the mind. Yoga is stilling the mind. You're doing an energetic practice in order to still your mind. So if anybody else your mind. So if anybody out there goes for runs and gets that runner's high to calm your mind down, guess what? That's yoga. That's what yoga is. Now with the asana practice, the postures we do, that's a health benefit. But the asana practice, that's just one small part of practicing yoga. Yoga is about observing yourself. It's about stilling your mind. I believe it's Psalms 48.10 that says, be still and know that I am God. That's yoga. Being still and knowing that God is God. So in it, we have to stop this crap. We have to stop this. Trying to divide Christians up by, oh, you're not a good Christian because you practice yoga, or you're not a good Christian because you do Tai Chi, is nothing but instigating violence against people who are good people. And it has to stop. It has to stop. If your pastor is telling you that yoga is demonic, you need to go find a new pastor. The Bible also says, judge not, least ye be judged. And the journey of yoga for me has been one of the greatest gifts that God has ever bestowed upon my life. It has been my life's journey. Going to India and living in India and going back and forth to India has changed my life in so many ways. It's made me a better person. It's made my faith in God stronger. It's made my love for humanity stronger. It's how I met my partner, which I know that he's the one God created for me. It's how we met. I have a nonprofit that I've started in India where I work with children in the slums who are subject to potential SCX trafficking, where we're able to help them get access and get support and get help. I've also rescued six dogs from India. My dog here, who is another love of my life, is a rescue from India. So when you go out when, or when people go out and say, oh, this is bad because she's doing yoga, you're discrediting everything that God has given me as a blessing in my life. And, you, and people are acting like they know better. They know God's plans for people's life better than God does. And that's narcissistic. It's arrogant. And it is also not in the Bible that yoga is demonic. So I would highly suggest for people who think that, go read the Yoga Sutras. Read them. It's, it's an easy read. It's only four padas, four chapters. Nowhere, nowhere do you see the mention of spirits. It's about calming your mind down and they talk about God, the Lord, one singular God. That's it. So 
We have to stop this moving forward. We absolutely have to stop this. Did we learn nothing from this past year learning how mainstream media sells propaganda? Well, so do other organizations like Dirty Pastors. They sell pop propaganda too. And the only way to combat propaganda is your own research. Take your power back. Nowhere in the Yoga Sutra does it talk about spirits. That is absolutely the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And it makes me just infuriated because it's, it's, it's degrading to, to good people. It's defaming good people. It's defaming God's plan for certain people. My, my teacher in India, we have conferences with my teacher in India once a week where people can ask him philosophy questions. He talks about Jesus all the time. He talks about Jesus all the time in conference. So is it really demonic spirits when he's talking about Jesus in conference? I just, it, it just, it breaks my heart. I would never go out and say like the exercise you're doing or the practice you're practicing is demonic. I would never say that unless you were literally standing at a satanic altar, making a sacrifice, you do you boo. Whatever God has led you to do, you do you. I also suffer from CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I went through a lot of therapy with that. And that with the yoga practice has really, 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 really helped me a lot. And my faith in God, the one singular God, has grown immensely through the practice of yoga. Immensely. And so I would really tell you guys, if you hear somebody saying that, ask them, have you read the Yoga Sutras? Have you actually read the Yoga Sutras? And if so, if you say you've read the Yoga Sutras, tell me the verse that talks about demonic spirits. I actually know the Yoga Sutras pretty thoroughly, and I can quote them in a lot of them in Sanskrit as well as English. And nowhere does it talk about demonic spirits. That is a complete lie. And in the Ten Commandments, God says not to lie. And that is a lie. All right. Anyway, that those people that think it's bad should probably try some yoga. And Carrie, I just noticed that you, respond, you responded and said the Bible conveniently skips the period of time Jesus' life when he traveled to India and learned to practice yoga. This at some point will be revealed as well. Yes, that is true. Um, there is a book called The Yoga of Jesus. Yogananda wrote The Yoga of Jesus. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve actually talks about Jesus going to India um, to study. So um, you are correct about that. And I'm sure that once we have all those 777 books from the Bible out of the Vatican Library for all human beings to see, we will definitely see that Jesus was very much in this yoga practice as well. And a lot of his, his a, lot, a lot of the teachings that Jesus gave us are teachings that come from yoga too. So there's a lot of crossover there. So I agree with you, Carrie. It's sad. It's really heartbreaking that so many Christians have been so manipulated and so MK ultraed about yoga that they really are, have such a disdain for something that they actually don't know anything about. That's sad. And hopefully moving forward, people will be more educated and will be less, less quick to judge others and faster to do research themselves on certain topics. All right, so you, last question, so this is the last question. You said, share your personal journey on being a YouTube interviewer tackling certain topics. So my personal journey on a YouTube, well, I've been thinking about doing a YouTube channel for a while. When I was thinking about doing a YouTube channel, I was working full time. I was running my own Mysore program. So I was pretty busy. We get up super early. When I had my own Mysore program, I would get up at like 3, 3.30 in the morning to be at the Shala early to teach. And I thought, you know, I'm done teaching by like 10. I do my practice and then by noon, I'm pretty much done for the day. So I thought, oh, it'd be fun to kind of like start a YouTube channel and just do like fringe stories. My first few videos, if you look on my playlist, were mostly ghost stories and mostly like sensational stories from the state of Georgia. I can put some of those playlists down in the description box below. And then once everything really kicked off with 2020, with what happened with 2020, my Shala had to close down. Not my boyfriend's Shala, but my own program had to close down. It was a new studio. And so the owner of the studio could not afford to keep the business open when we were not allowed to have customers. So I think a lot of people understand that. And so at that point, when we were under lockdown, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to start my YouTube channel now. And so I started doing this YouTube channel and it took me a while to like 
figure things out and really figure out how to how to do everything on YouTube. But I it gave me something to do during lockdown. I would research these stories and then film them and edit them and all that kind of stuff. And then once things really heated up this past summer, summer of 2020, I started getting a little bit more open with my own beliefs. I talked more about what we were experiencing, the truth of what we were experiencing, and that kind of got me um, connections with other people in the truth or community, which is really how my channel exploded. David Zublik is the reason why my channel has gotten so big because he then brought me on the dark outpost to talk about bloodlines and blood groups. And then after that, I met my friend Anna down in Brazil. She has her own channel and she introduced me to Tom the Gemantria numbers. I'll put a link to his channel down in the description box below as well. And through Tom, I got to do some episodes with Charlie Ward and Wano Savin as of late. And then of course, Tarot by Janine and Tamara over in Australia. So it just kind of organically grew from there. I, my favorite videos to do are the interviews because when I interview someone, then I get to sit back and learn. I get to like ask questions like you guys and like learn from these people. I was blown away by the things Wano Savin was saying in our phone call with Tom. Tamara always blows me away by what she has to say, as does Janine as well. And of course, I love David to death. David Zublik is awesome. And so I've had these incredible experiences where I've got to meet these awesome people all over the world, but it's been a very natural, natural thing. Now, as far as my own videos where I research a topic and I put it together like a storytelling topic, those are a lot harder to do. Those are a lot harder to do just because of the process of doing them. So I, for example, yesterday I filmed, I got up really early and I filmed a video on blood types. This video will drop next Friday. Um, and I filmed it and it took me about an hour to film it. And then it took me five and a half hours to edit it. So this is a 40 minute video that took me five and a half hours to edit. That's how tedious it can be. And then after that was over, I had to then go film another video to edit it. Now, the reason why I was so backed up is because we're actually leaving town on Monday. And so I wanted to make sure I had videos in the docket to drop for you guys while we were going to be out of town. So that's why I was kind of backed up. But you definitely, you know, I'm so appreciative of being monetized, being able to put commercials on some of my videos, not all of them. But you don't make that much money off of monetization. I think sometimes people think that, you know, these YouTubers make a ton of money working from home, creating these videos, and it's a lot harder than it looks. And you also don't really make that much. Like what I make off of monetization, I would not be able to support myself. I We have to have a two income. Uh, people who maybe have like over 100,000 subscribers or 200,000 subscribers or well into the millions that do things like makeup channels or like drama channels, those people make a lot of money on YouTube, but it's because they get a lot more hits it's the algorithms, it's the subject matter they're talking about. So if you're looking to do YouTube as like a career, then no, it's going to take a while to get to that point where you're able to like financially stabilize yourself. And that's why I'm so freaking appreciative of all of our patrons. Our patrons here on this channel, you guys are all rock stars. I love you guys. You guys are the reason why we're able to like afford new lights and afford new equipment. And when I have to like order books, because I can't get the full book off online, you know, because we have patrons, I'm able to then order books for research. So I really, really appreciate that. And you'll notice a lot of people that are in, um, a lot of my peers in this community, in this like truther community, have patrons because that is literally what helps keep the channel afloat so that you can continue doing what you do because a lot of truthers out there also work full-time jobs on top of doing the channel so it is a lot a lot a lot of work but I feel extremely blessed to have um to have this channel I feel so freaking blessed to have all of you guys on this channel with me and I feel really 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 blessed by um all the connections that I've made. It's just been incredible to meet so many people from all over the world. I feel like I've known these people my whole life that I've met through YouTube and that's a really special place to be. And so it's, it's just a, 
an honor and a privilege to be able to have a platform. And it's an honor and a privilege that you guys are willing to listen to me yab about strange topics and all that kind of stuff. So I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. I feel like Esoteric Atlanta isn't just me or Todd or um, Josh McKay, the guy who does our music. I feel like it's all of us. Like all of you guys are also a part of Esoteric Atlanta, right? Because where we go one, we go all. And we're all in this together. I would not be where I am without you. And, and I'm sure you feel the same way about other people in your life that you wouldn't be where you were without certain other people. We are all interconnected. And I am so grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for sending all of the questions in. I hope that answered some of your questions. Some of the questions I don't have a diehard answer because that's just kind of how I am anyway. I'm pretty open-minded person. Um, but if you have any more questions, um, send them in and then maybe in a few months in the future, we can sit down and do another Q and A. I do have a question for my patrons. If you are a patron on this channel, I've been thinking about doing like a zoom party where we can all like get together one night on zoom and just hang out. I was going to reach out to some of my other truther friends and see if they wanted to like combine it together with their patrons. And so we could just have like a night where we just kind of like, even though we can't, be together. We could like be together on Zoom and just like chit chat and hang out and get to know each other. So let me know down in the comment section if you're a patron, if that's something that you would be interested in. And we can look at planning that and I can talk to some other people too and see about doing a joint, a joint event. So you would get to talk to them as well, the other channel people as well. So anyway, I hope that you guys have a wonderful day. I'm going to go check and see if my niece is here yet. And I will talk to all of you soon. Bye. No